I have a tendency to conform a lot. Let me explain what I mean by that. I grew up in El Paso, Texas. It's a predominantly Spanish-speaking city. And so uh, I grew up listening to music in Spanish and speaking in Spanish. And uh, in particular, I grew up uh, you know, listening to rock in Espanol and baladas, corridos, cumbias. I, I was constantly listening to music in Spanish and speaking in Spanish, because that's just the way everybody uh, spoke in, in El Paso. When I moved to Oklahoma City, uh, I conformed yet again to a new culture. This time, uh, I conformed to a new basketball team. So I've always been a San Antonio Spurs basketball fan. But when I moved to Oklahoma City, uh, the uh, Oklahoma City Thunder started there. And every year, they got better and better and better. And uh, by the time I left Oklahoma City, I'll, I'll admit, I was a little bit of a bandwagon fan. It was exciting to see the team getting better every single year. So I conformed there. I also conformed in Chicago when I moved there. You see, in Chicago, it's kind of hard to live there and not become a foodie. But before Chicago, I loved chain restaurants. I loved going to uh, places that I could go to uh, that I went to back home. And uh, just chain restaurants were a comfort for me for some reason. But when I moved to Chicago, I started liking, uh, you know, hole-in-the-wall places and, and local places. And, and I just fell in love with different types of food from all over the world. And I became a foodie. I conformed to that. Speaking of food, when I moved to Louisiana, I conformed yet again. And I started doing something that uh, most of my family isn't comfortable with yet. But I started eating crawfish and boudin and gator. And I even learned to make red beans and rice. And uh, you're supposed to eat them on Monday, right? I think that's what I was told. I'll be honest with you, but don't tell my family. Uh, I've also conformed a little bit when it comes to sports. Uh, I might be a little bit of a LSU Tiger football fan, but just a little bit. Everywhere I go, I have tended to conform. I have a tendency to conform, right? To do my best to fit in to the culture and the community that I live in. See, conforming by conforming, I let the community around me create a new way of living within me. But I have to tell you, conforming is tough. See, conforming forces me to leave a part of me behind so that I can make room for a new self. Uh, yes, I still listen to music in Spanish, but I've made room for oh, so many other genres of music now. I am still the biggest uh, Texas fan of Texas football. I love uh, UT Austin. I love orange, burnt orange to be precise. I love everything about the University of Texas. But I've made some room for LSU. See, to conform means to uh, live in this, uh, uh, it means to create some new space for something new. And in order to do so, you have to let go of something, but not all of it. At least that's my opinion. See, uh, to conform is to place yourself at the, uh, to place one foot in the realm of something new, new possibilities, while leaving a foot behind in the realm of comfort. Yes, I love the Spurs, but I made room for the Thunder. Yes, I love chain restaurants, but I've made room for local places. Do, do you see the picture? To conform means to make room uh, for new ways of living and new ways of doing things. In the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 2, Paul says this about conforming. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. See, I think as Paul looks around at people, he begins to see a pattern. He's been teaching about forgiveness. That's a huge part of his theology and, and what he teaches people. And he's been teaching about forgiveness. And he sees that people, for the most part, are willing to move towards forgiveness, right? They're willing to take one step and move into the realm of forgiveness. But he also notices <coughs> that people are trying to still hold on to the past, to live somewhere between forgiveness and sin, with one foot into forgiveness and one foot behind in sin. You see, I think Paul looks at people and says they are forgiven. They know they are forgiven, but somehow they still live as if sin is more powerful than them. 
I think you can say that about all of us. I think we can all agree that sin is bad, that sin causes me harm and you harm and others harm, and more importantly, that sin separates us from God. I I think we can all agree that sin is bad. But somehow, I I don't think we fully believe or understand or are willing to accept what it means to be forgiven. I don't know that any of us truly believe that we can escape the power of sin. Let me say that again. I think all of us believe in forgiveness, but I don't think all of us truly, fully understand that forgiveness means that we can overcome, overpower the sins in our life. Somehow, even though we are forgiven, it feels like we're simply bound to sin over and over and over again. Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever feel like, yes, you are forgiven, but in the back of, the mind, in the back of your mind, you wonder, am I going to mess up again? Am I going to hurt somebody again? I've seen this pattern within me over and over again. Is it going to continue to happen to me? Do you ever feel that way? At the beginning of Romans, it's a book we've been going through, Paul argues that the human mind and heart are uh, naturally, at its core, naturally dark and rebellious, full of wickedness and evil. He doesn't say those exact words, but he, he hints at it throughout the beginning chapter of Romans. And I can't help but wonder, do we believe that that's all there is to life? That all of us are sinners, that that's who we naturally are and there's nothing we can do about it? Do we believe that we are bound to hurt people left and right and and that we just have to go back to God and ask for forgiveness every single time? And that's the best there is to life. That all there is to life is to do the best we can and we're going to fall a million times and every time we have to ask God for forgiveness and we're going to do that over and over and over again endlessly until the day we die. Is that all there is to life? Is that as good as it gets? Look, I've got to be honest with you. I refuse to believe that that's as good as it gets. I refuse to believe that that's all there is to life, which I think that's why Paul's words are so important. That's why the scripture is so important. You see, I think the world wants us to conform into this way of thinking that, uh, yes, forgiveness is true and, and, and forgiveness is ours and we are forgiven, but... But sin still has power over us. Yes, you're forgiven, but you know, you're probably still going to fall and you're still going to make mistakes. And, and yes, you're forgiven, but uh, you will never be better than your sins and your sins will always have power over you. And no matter how hard you try, you're just going to sin over and over again. See, Paul is trying to pull us away from that and say, don't conform. Says, he says, don't conform to that. See, we, we can't conform to that way of thinking. Because, see, forgiveness, yeah, we have to believe that it is about transformation. We have to believe that when God forgives us of our sins, there has to be more than just, okay, you're forgiven, I'll forgive you next time. We have to believe that when we are forgiven, Transformation begins to happen in our lives. A transformation that begins to empower us, to embolden us, to make us stronger than our sins and our shortcomings and our faults. See, to conform means that even though we know we're forgiven, we settle for sin being more powerful than us, for sin controlling our lives. When we begin, when we think of sin, when we think of, um, when we begin to conform to this world, we begin to think that, well, let's just not sin that much, but I'm going to sin anyway. See, here's the deal. 
If we live life conforming to that thought, if we live life thinking that uh, we're just bound to sin and nothing's ever going to change and we just have to deal with it and ask God for forgiveness every single day, if we truly believe that that's as good as forgiveness gets, then what we're really saying is that God has no power over sin. That forgiveness is simply a band-aid to a a wound that's never going to heal. If we conform to that way of thinking, we are making God very powerless. See, the point of forgiveness is not just to put a band-aid on and say, oh, it's okay, it'll get better. The point of forgiveness is that we may be transformed and renewed in such a way that we can have power over sin. That power will lose its grip against us. That, 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 that sin will lose its grip against us. That, that sin will have no power over us. Let me say that again, because I want to make sure I'm clear on that. The point of forgiveness is that we may be transformed and renewed in such a way that we may have power over sin. That sin will have no power over us. In fact, to be forgiven is to be transformed and renewed in a way that sin has lost its grip on us. See, we may be naturally inclined to sin, right? To wickedness and evil, as Paul says earlier, but we were not created to live that way. You may look at me and say, Fernie, I, I just, I, I tend to hurt people and I tend to say the wrong things and I tend to overreact and I tend to do this and that and, and I know God forgives me. That's just who I am. I want to tell you, you were not created to live that way. God intends for you to have power over those sins, over those struggles. God did not create you so that sin can have power over you. And so we need to embrace forgiveness, truly embrace it, because when we do, we become transformed and renewed in such a way that we gain power over sin. Look, I want to tell you this. When we uh, truly believe that forgiveness changes something, that it transforms us, here's what happens. We go from saying, God, thank you for forgiving me of this sin. We go from that to saying, God, thank you for giving me power over sin. To be forgiven means to be transformed and renewed in such a way that it's not just anger, that it's not just uh, bad habits, that it's that it's a, a completion of power over sin. That because God lives in you, because you have been transformed, you now have power over sin. You see, to be forgiven is a way of life and not just a singular moment. Let me read this text to you one more time. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Friends, do not, let, uh, do not conform to this world. Do not conform to this idea that you will never have power over your struggles, over your shortcomings, over your sins. Because if you ever conform you're settling for life for less than abundant life. Instead, invite forgiveness to transform and renew you. Invite forgiveness to give you power over your sin. Invite forgiveness to help you break, break the bondage that sin has over you. Invite forgiveness to remind you that God is bigger and greater than all of your sins and all of your shortcomings and all of your struggles. And in doing so, I believe that you and I will experience true forgiveness, not just for this moment, but for eternity. And not just for eternity, but for this moment. God wants you to have power over sin, not just someday, but today. So be transformed. Do not conform 
to the ways of this world, the ways that tell us that sin will always be more powerful than you. Be transformed. Let forgiveness reign in your life in such a way that you are transformed and you will know with full assurance that you have power over sin. My prayer is that you may accept that reality for yourself. That you may allow forgiveness to, conf uh, to transform you and not allow yourself to be conformed by this world because you don't fully believe in the power of forgiveness. I pray you may believe that. I pray it may be so. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for who you are. Despite our inability to overcome sin on our own, you love us enough to not leave us there helpless against sin. You have offered us forgiveness and offer it new every single morning. God, I pray that forgiveness may not just be something we conform to and uh, rely on in our darkest moments, but God, I pray that forgiveness may bring transformation and renewal in our lives. Uh, such a powerful transformation that we may know without a doubt that you are giving us power over sin. God, may forgiveness transform us so that we may live out our lives differently. May it be so. Amen.